So Web API is a Java 8 spring application. It's providing the RESTful API endpoints that, that Atlas is using, as you just saw. Uh, some learning resources. So Web API is using a number of components and technologies under the hood. I'm just pointing out a few of what I think are the important ones to take a look at. So we use Maven um, for, for managing our Java dependencies. Uh, You'll, you'll see there is a file called pom.xml in the root of Web API, which basically defines all of the Java libraries and dependencies that are induced by the project. Uh, we make use of Spring, uh, Spring version 1 particularly. Uh, this allows for a number of features, in particular the, the REST services, but also we use it in some other ways, which I'm not going to cover today. Uh, we make use of Hibernate, which is an object relational mapping. So Hibernate is a library that allows us to bridge the gap between the web API database tables and Java without having to write a lot of SQL, just for that aspect of it. We have other SQL that's used to interact with the CDM, which I'll show you in a moment, but the Hibernate is used between the Java application and the web API database to do most of its data um, kind of CRUD operations. If you're familiar with that term, that's for create, update, read, and delete. And then finally, Flyway. So we use this um, component called Flyway to make changes to the Web API database. Uh, it's, it's a nice tool that allows for uh, generating or for creating SQL that is then executed in sequence so that we can make um, sequential changes to the Web API database as we're adding new features for development purposes. So I did want to just kind of point out that Web API does have a connection to Hades, and this is Web API is kind of the uh, the bridge. So within Web API's pom.xml, if you do a search for org.odyssey, you're going to come across a few Hades libraries, and I just wanted to point those out here. So we make use of the SQL render library to translate any and all SQL that is going to go against the OMOP common data model so that it's translated to the same uh, to the specific dialect. Uh, for that database. We make use of feature extraction, which is a library used by the characterization module to construct aggregate summary statistics for cohorts. And then finally, there's another library called Hydra that's used by the estimation and prediction modules in Atlas to produce an R study package based on adjacent input specification. So don't worry too much about these, but I did want to note that if anyone was interested in that topic. OK, so Web API development tools. Again, you're going to need Git for working with the source code. And probably most importantly, you're going to need one or more OMOP CDMs. This will not, you're not going to get very far, unfortunately, with Web API if you don't have access to um, at least some synthetic data or if you have a proper OMOP common data model in your organization to make use of, that would be ideal. You'll also want to have a Postgres SQL database server for the web API database. And this is an important point because this database is just for holding the designs that you build. It is not your OMOP common data model. It does not hold patient level data. It is simply a, a way to persist information that web API wants to use between sessions. Uh, and then finally, you'll want to have a Java integrated development environment with support for Maven. I use Apache NetBeans. Uh, there's others in the community that use IntelliJ, which is a commercial product. Uh, there may be others, but these are the two most common that I've run across. Uh, of course, if you have a Java IDE that you're uh, comfortable with and it, you, it can support Maven, then you should be fine. So for getting started, uh, you'll want to follow the Web API installation guide with a couple of notes. So in the installation guide, we talk about setting up Tomcat to host Web API. If you are doing development and you're using something like Apache NetBeans, you don't necessarily need Tomcat. You can actually run Web API in NetBeans, and so you don't necessarily need the web server um, hosted on your machine. So I'll, I'll show you how that's how that looks in a moment. Again, you'll want to clone all of the code to your machine using Git. And since I have a new machine here that I was just setting up. Uh, the first time I opened the pack, uh, the project in Apache NetBeans, it gave me an, a message saying that there was a problem with the project and that it needed to prime the project. And all that's doing is it's basically downloading the many different Java dependencies that uh, Web API has. And once that's done and it runs through the build process, 
the next time you open the project, it will not give you that that message. So if you do see that, that's perfectly normal um, and to be expected. So hopefully once you get through that process, you don't see it anymore. OK, so I'm going to take you through how I've set up my environment uh, for using Web API. I'll show you a bit about how the code is structured and to kind of follow on with the Atlas example, I'm going to show you some of the um, Java code that's used in the prediction module. So let me bounce out of PowerPoint and let's go. Let's start with Postgres. So. I have Postgres installed on my local machine. If your environment, you have Postgres servers available on a different machine, that's perfectly fine. The thing that you'll want to make sure you set up is in, there is an Odyssey database or a web API database. The Odyssey database, as we call it, contains, um, contains a primary schema. This public schema is just a default and has nothing in it. But the web API schema is where web API will put all of its resources. In this case, it needs tables, it has sequences, it has uh, views, I believe. So all of these tables and all of these sequences are automatically created by Web API using that flyway mechanism I mentioned earlier. So when you initially set up Web API and you create this Odyssey database, which we have instructions for on the wiki, this will be effectively an empty schema. This, this Web API schema. The first time that you build Web API and you run it, uh, Web API will go through all of the flyway scripts and it will set up all of these tables for you. What it will not do is it will not set up any information it needs to connect to a particular CDM data store, source, which if I um, query this, I've already set up one for, again, on my local host. So if I select star from Web API source, you will see that I have one source, which in this case is the Cynthia 1K data set. I've configured this to point at my local host 5432 indicates that this is my local Postgres server. Uh, I've provided it with the default application information. And if I jump up one level, you can see that I have you know, the Cynthia 1K database on my machine. This Cynthia 1K database has uh, couple of schemas, in particular the public schema. I could have probably renamed this to be CDM, but this is effectively where my CDM tables are. Hopefully some of this looks familiar if you have gotten familiar with the CDM itself. It also contains a results schema. Again, this is described on the wiki for Web API. So the um, things that I'd like to point out is that I have run Achilles on this Cynthia data set, so I have available to me the Achilles results, which are used by the data sources feature in Atlas. I also have a number of results tables. These results tables are used by Web API when you are, say, generating a cohort or generating a characterization study. And so once, once I have all of that set up, I can then start to make use of the project inside of NetBeans. So one of the, so if you're not familiar, this is Apache NetBeans. I'm using version 13. One of the first things that you need to do when you start to work with Web API is you need to create a settings.xml file, which is under the project files in uh, NetBeans. And what the settings.xml allows you to do is to uh, provide um, settings that are specific to your environment. So you'll notice that there is a, a Web API Postgres SQL profile that I've set up here. And what this is doing is just allowing me to tell Web API where to find uh, the database that I've set up for Juice, the accounts to use to connect to the database to make changes, and a host of other uh, settings. This uh, particular file, if I can jump over to GitHub really quick, we provide in the root of Web API, there is a sample settings.xml. And this sample settings is just a trying to be a helpful mechanism for setting up that file so that you kind of have a template to work off of. You'll want to, of course, make changes to things like your data source URL if you're hosting your database on a different server, for example, or make any other changes there. Um, one plea I will make for documentation is that we have. <laughs> 
uh, very sparse documentation on some of these settings. So it would be great if people wanted to help us uh, document what all of these settings are, due, uh, are doing in the application. And one way to do that is to actually look at the other sources that are in the project. So under there, under source main resources, under default package and application properties, this application.properties file is effectively listing all of the configurable options for web API. And you're using the settings.xml to effectively uh, override or provide input values into this document. And this is done at compilation time when you create the web API war file. Some other things that I'll point out since I'm under the resources directory, uh, there are different migration scripts for Postgres. These are the flyway scripts that I was talking about earlier. So these are all of the um, changes that have been made over time in the project to uh, make changes to the web API database. And I'll, I'll kind of show you a specific example with the prediction module in a bit. Under some of these resources dot something dot SQL is where you'll find uh, SQL that is being used to uh, query the results schema or the CDM schema on your CDM database. So if you were looking for um, the any sort of like, uh, let me see, the incidence rate SQL, you could actually pop that open here and take a look at it. And let me see. OK, let me get into the Java code now. Hopping back up a level. So under the source packages is where you're going to find the Java code that's used in Web API. And you'll see that it is organized into different namespaces. I will point out the entry point for the project overall is under org.odyssey.webapi. There's the web API.java class. I only point this out because for me it was I think one of the first things I was looking for was how does this thing even start up? Uh, it's maybe a little bit hidden, but if you can see it very carefully, it has a little green play button next to it, which kind of indicates that it is the entry point for the application. And from there, what I would want to show you guys is a bit about the prediction module, just as an exemplar. So if I go under org.odyssey.webapi.prediction, you'll find a few classes here. I'm going to start with the prediction controller. So the prediction controller is what provides the rest endpoint to web API. So one of the things that you'll see here is this annotation with a path for prediction. And if you were to look back at the call that we made to web API, right, this is the prediction endpoint that we were hitting before. Uh, specifically, though, there is a there should be a method that gets all of the analyses, right? So there's this get analysis list, which you can see is the default for the path when there are no other arguments on the end of that URL. And so again, you have this get analysis list method, which is returning the list of all of the predictions in the system. So what I can do here, if I wanted to get um, you know, a deeper understanding of what's happening on this endpoint, I can set a breakpoint in um, NetBeans. So I've set a breakpoint for this method. I can jump back to my browser here and refresh this endpoint. And what you'll see is that now NetBeans has stopped the execution of this service. So it would allow me to start to dive into uh, particular variables that are in use if I wanted to debug or step through some of this code, I could do that using some of the tools that are up here in the toolbar. And some of this gets into the, the weeds a bit, but if I just let this go, uh, eventually this will return back and you'll have this the same results. So this is one way that if you want to uh, start to get an understanding of what the application is doing, it allows you to kind of jump in, take a look, you know, kind of get in there and kind of look under the hood in more detail than maybe just reading static code. So there's a few things that are being used under, under this particular controller. In particular, there is a service. The service is effectively providing a abstraction for 
getting at the different um, database, the pieces of database information that the prediction module needs to use, but it is in fact not actually the piece that is controlling the database access. It is um, a mechanism for just abstracting out some of the business logic that may be used when you're doing things like creating or updating an analysis or exporting. Uh, let's see here. So what I did want to show is a bit about Hibernate and how that hooks into uh, the Java piece. So if I look at the prediction analysis class, which again is under this uh, org.odyssey.webapi.prediction, this prediction analysis class is what's using Hibernate to get at, you can see it here by the import statements that are at the very top. It's using an entity called prediction analysis which then maps to the database table prediction. So if I if I were to go back over to my database here and I wanted to look at what is in the prediction table, you'll see that it's a, a fairly simplistic table. It has a, a prediction ID, a name, a description, and the specification, which in this case is a fairly large JSON blob. And if you look at the definition of this class, you'll actually see that there are a number of getters and setters that allow us to work with the ID and the name and the description, as well as the specification. The annotations that are used here, in particular, the um, at column names, the at generic generator, these are all part of the Hibernate framework. So these allow us to uh, map this particular Java class to the table or tables that exist inside of the web API database without having to write a lot of SQL for um, just doing basic things like just grabbing all of the uh, entries in a table. And the benefit of doing this is that it allows us to uh, not necessarily worry about the underlying database that it's working against. So Hibernate has support for a number of database platforms. Uh, we've standardized on Postgres because it's open source and it's also the one that um, seems to be most prevalent in the community, as well as it's the one that we can provide community support for. In some cases though, Hibernate doesn't do maybe everything that we might want. We might have to create a separate class called a, a repository in this case. So here we had a couple of queries that we needed to write that allowed us to make sure that if you were to try and save or create a prediction study that had the same name as a study that was already in the system, uh, the, these methods are used to just basically find out if uh, prediction has that name already, and if it does, it, it will help um, prevent that operation from happening on the front end. And then finally, the last piece I wanted to show is the, the flyway script that was used to create the prediction tables. So again, this, this particular file is found under the resources. And if I were to go to migration Postgres, this was in the 2.6 or 2.7 range, somewhere in here. Uh, effectively, you can write SQL. I mean, this shouldn't look too different if you're familiar with SQL and you wanted to create a, a table or a sequence. You're basically uh, creating the SQL by hand. So I wrote this particular piece of SQL to create the prediction table and to create some uh, foreign key references to make sure that uh, the user IDs that created the design are recorded in the database and that they are you know, tied to a user that exists in the system. So let me let me stop here for the demo side. That was pretty much all I had to go through. So we've got about five minutes. So I, I just wanted to say in summary, Hopefully this was useful. I know it's a lot to try and go through in a fairly short amount of time. We could dive deeper into a lot of these topics. Um, but if you're interested, join the Atlas and Web API working group. If you're interested in getting involved in the development, uh, we'd be happy to, to have you first and foremost. And then if you're interested in learning more about the tools, we could use that as a forum to start that conversation. So thank you. Anthony, join that was really wonderful. Yep. Thank you so much for that dive. That was fantastic. I did have a quick question for you. Yep. Uh, I'm a big fan of the web API documentation, which lists all the rest endpoints. And I'm interested in 
don't know if you can show how we can document the code where it'll be automatically helping us with the uh, with filling out documentation pieces of descriptions within within this uh, within the web API. Yeah, no, thanks, Paul. Let me let me show you at least um, some of what I am aware of that has been documented. So we have under the evidence service, if I can find that in the code, the effectively these documents, let me just start there. These documents are generated based on comments that exist in the Java code itself. So if you wanted to update these documents, you're effectively adding comments in a structured format. If you're familiar with Java docs at all, this is using Java docs to generate this documentation. So if I were to go to the evidence service, which I believe is located under slightly different spot. It's under service, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll see comments such as this. So at the very top of the evidence service, we have a REST service for querying the common evidence model. And you'll see that this comment is both at the very top of the activity. No, it is not. Okay, let me find a particular method. So you'll find things like this. So, so these were, maybe this is a bad example, but these were methods that I created for an application called Penelope, which is um, ages old. But these are methods that we had created that we plan to not carry forward when we issue a new major version of web API. So one of the reasons why I commented this was to try and provide people with that information in the form of a comment. And the structure of this is basically a, a description at the very top. And you'll see things like the at summary for just summarizing what the method does, the at param, so you can describe all of the input parameters for the particular function that's being called and an at return to just describe what that particular rest em endpoint is returning. And then once you compile and regenerate the documentation, that is uh, translated into this kind of nicely formatted set of documents that you can see here. So let me see if I can find that particular endpoint that was study slash cohort. There we go. So hopefully that answers your question, Paul. It does. I really like that the it putting those conventions and that structure in the documentation because it really makes it much more readable on the documentation side. Yeah, definitely. And this is where we can absolutely use some help from the community. So if you're again interested in getting involved and you're starting to dive into this code, a uh, really I'd say a nice contribution would be just documenting what you believe the method is doing, and we can always refine it. But you, as you'll see, if you go through this resource, most of the methods are not documented at all. And you can blame me for that. So <laughs> any other questions before we turn it over to our next presenter? We got about two minutes here. Yeah, that was great. And I think that may be fun to do as a group activity that we can go through the documentation and look for opportunities to, to add to it. So I think that would be a, a great workshop to put together. Yeah, Katie has a good question. Uh, is there a rule for what goes in the web API database versus a source CDM database? So I would say, yeah, the rule of thumb for what you should put into the web API database are things that are used for defining designs and definitely not patient level data. So we do not want to create endpoints in in the web API's uh, code base that would potentially transfer any patient level data into the web API. Uh, we, we also don't store aggregate statistics in the web API database. We kind of offload that to the CDM itself. That's what we mainly use the, uh, the results schema for. So I'm jumping around here, but this is my uh, Cynthia database and I have the results schema. And so all of the uh, result aggregate results that exist exist in this schema and its tables. This way we kind of keep keep all of the patient level data and the aggregate results you know, within the CDM itself and not within the web API database. 